When I was about eight years old, our family lived in Akron, Ohio. We lived in a small row house on 23rd Street in what was called the Kenmore District of Akron. Now, this photo is of my brother, Joe, and me standing on the porch of that house. And we must be getting ready for church because just check out those sweet jackets. Anyway, my prized possession at that point in my young life was a hand-me-down bicycle that I think my parents had received from some friends at church, but it was a red 20-inch two-wheeler with dented fenders, and it was mine. And I love that little bike. I remember my friends and I would uh, use clothespins to clip baseball cards to the spokes so uh, our bikes would sound like motorcycles as we rode them around the block. It was so cool. Probably had thousands of dollars worth of cars destroyed doing that. But maybe some of you did the same thing. But my bike came with one responsibility. At the end of every day after playing with friends, I was to take that bike and put it in our garage, uh, our, our detached garage at the end of our driveway just to keep it safe. Well, one day, for some reason, maybe I was in a hurry or late for supper or just maybe lazy. I forgot to put my bike in the garage. And the next morning, my bike was gone. Someone had stolen my hand-me-down red 20-inch two-wheeler with dented fenders, and I was devastated. I was also in a little trouble with my dad, but that's a whole different story. And by the way, uh, Dad, if you're watching this, happy Father's Day, Pop. You're my hero and always have been. Well, I remember thinking to myself, what kind of person steals a little kid's bike? And it was the first time it dawned on me that the world was not full of good people, that there were some people who did bad things. We're in a summer-long series now called Did God Say That? And we're taking a look at some things people often say that sound like they should be in the Bible, but on further study turned out to be something that God either did not say or kind of a distorted version of something he did say. And last week, Pastor Jeff took on the phrase, everything happens for a reason. If you didn't get a chance to watch his sermon, go back and take a look because Jeff gave us a terrific theological primer on the intersection of the sovereignty of God and the free will of humankind. And he used the whiteboard to do it. So so take a look at that. Today we take on a different saying, and that is this, people are basically good. Let's put it in the form of a question, are people basically good? Now that question's been around for centuries and it still rages today. Uh, Here's how it goes. Are people born good and then taught to do bad things by society and societal structures, or Are people born with a natural bent towards selfishness and evil? And then society creates laws to try to control and limit that evil. For example, just this week I saw an article from CNN. Quote, when we hear about bad things happening, we need to remind ourselves that people are generally good. We are hardwired for goodness. The vast majority of people, when faced with simple, clear, ethical choices, will choose good over bad. In other words, most people are mostly good most of the time. But compare that with another statement, a quote from Russian philosopher Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote this. The line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil. So, are people basically good? Here's the biblical answer. Yes and no. Sound confusing? Well, how can I say people are basically good and at the same time say people are not basically good? Maybe we should take a moment to define our terms a bit. What does basically good mean? Does the word basically mean absolutely, completely good, or does it mean more or less good? For example, if my wife bakes cookies and after tasting one I say, these cookies are basically good, Do I mean that the cookies are absolutely good? I mean the best cookies in the history of cookies. Or do I mean, yeah, they're pretty good. They're okay. Big difference. If we say people are basically good and we mean that people are absolutely and completely good, we have a hard time explaining my stolen bike all those years ago. We have a hard time explaining why two-year-olds suddenly start shouting, mine, mine. 
And we have a really hard time explaining something as complicated and destructive as systemic racial injustice. But if we mean people are generally good, people are capable of good, that's a whole different thing. Now, for our purposes today, uh, let's define basically good in the strongest possible way. Let's agree that basically good means people are fundamentally and completely good, morally, spiritually, relationally, completely good. If that's our definition, I think the Bible answers the question in three ways. People were once good, people are no longer good, and people can be made good again. Let's start with once good, the image of God. Years ago, I was in my mid-20s, struggling my way through graduate school, trying to clarify God's direction in my life, and I was working all day as a substitute teacher, then as a basketball coach, going to my grad classes at night. So one night in the middle of the winter in Indiana, I finished class about 10 o'clock and jumped in my car to make about the 40-minute drive back to my apartment. It was really cold, January, February, snowing like crazy, and about five minutes into my drive home, my old beater car stalled out, just died right in the middle of an intersection. So there I am, stuck in the road, late at night. It's cold and it's snowing like crazy. Cell phones were a decade from being invented, so I had no idea what to do. So while I'm sitting there contemplating my very limited options, uh, including the possibility of freezing to death in my car, uh, I noticed a man, the only person I could see, Uh, And he had turned, seen my car, and was walking straight across the intersection toward me. He had a dark coat on, hood pulled up over his head. I couldn't see his face, hands jammed in his pockets, and he was headed straight toward my car. Now, my first instinct, as you might understand, was to make sure my doors were locked. I mean, it was late at night. This was a stranger. I had no idea what his intentions were. And he came right up to my car, right up to my window, and sort of motioned for me to roll down the window, which I rolled down about an inch. He said, pop the hood. Now, all kinds of thoughts were going through my head. I mean, what's he going to do? Is he going to disable my engine and rob me? Something worse. I mean, I've seen TV shows. I've seen the movies. And I could hear him tinkering with something under the hood. And just a minute or two later, he leaned out around the hood, and he said, hey, try it again. I put the key in, turned it, and my car started right up. The guy just slammed the hood, nodded at me, and walked off into the snowstorm. I drove home safely that night, surprised and humbled by that stranger's goodness to me that night. Now, I'm sure most of you can think of a story like that. As pastor here at Chapel Street now for over 30 years, I've had the privilege of witnessing countless acts of extraordinary love and generosity. I've seen a 75-year-old man donate one of his own kidneys to his adult daughter who was struggling with chronic disease and needed a transplant. An act of extraordinary goodness and sacrificial love. Just recently, a Chapel Streeter gave me his entire government stimulus check so I could then give it to Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry so that we as a church could keep caring for those who were in need. An act of extraordinary goodness and generosity. A week or so ago, a group of Chapel Street musicians uh, took their instruments and played hymns for seniors who were quarantined at the Homestead. Now, this kind of goodness, of course, is not limited to us as a church. One of the redemptive things I think we're seeing, if we pay attention, right here during the current issues in our country, are the dozens and dozens of examples of really good things people are doing in their neighborhoods and for each other. So, are people good? Are people capable of extraordinary goodness? Yes, they are. We are. And the Bible tells us why. If we look at Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, beginning in verse 27, here's what we read. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So the Bible tells us that we were created in the image of God. By the way, uh, Jeff has been mentoring me recently on the use of the whiteboard. I think he would be very proud today. 
The Bible tells us we were, have been created in the image of God, and it's very good. More than that, in Psalm 8 we read, yet you have made him, humankind, a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. So, Yes, people are basically good in the sense that every human being is created in the image of God. Now, what is the image of God? What does it mean to be created in his image? The Bible tells us that the image of God is what separates us as human beings from the rest of the created order. In the immediate context of Genesis, it tells, it tells us that God commanded humankind to exercise dominion over the earth. That is, we are responsible in some way for God's creation. So the image of God then means we have the capacity for responsibility in a way the rest of creation does not. It means we have the capacity for free will. Jeff talked about this last week, which means we have the capacity for wisdom. The image of God gives us the capacity to choose our behavior that is to act over against our biological drives and instincts. For example, in the animal world, when animals are in heat, they mate. That's just what animals do. But we as human beings have been given the capacity to choose our behavior over against our biological drives. So we can choose, therefore, to discipline ourselves and our drives and choose to be linked in marriage monogamously for a lifetime with another person. We are in the image of God. We have the capacity to create as God creates. Art and music and engineering all are part of the image of God. And most importantly, the image of God gives us the capacity to love, to love those in our family, to love not just those in our family, to love those who love us back, but to also love those who don't love us back, to love our neighbor who maybe does not know us, to love those outside of our group, to love those who are unlike us, and even to love those who do not love us back. In short, the image of God gives us the capacity for goodness. Being created in the image of God means human beings are good in two primary ways. First, because to bear the image of God means that every human being is equally and eternally loved and valued by God. And this is why, by the way, we are instinctively outraged by injustice, and we should be. Secondly, because to bear the image of God means that every human being is capable of expressing the image of God. Every human being is capable of goodness through love generosity, service, compassion, grace, and forgiveness. Years ago, my dad was on a ministry trip in Lima, Peru, I think it was, and he was on a crowded street trying to take a picture with his brand new camera. He had both hands on his camera, and he was robbed in broad daylight. A guy came up behind him and sort of jumped him, shoved his hand in my dad's back pocket, and just ripped out everything he had in his pocket, wallet, money, passport, everything, and started running down the street. My dad realized that the guy had also gotten his lens cap for his brand new camera. So my dad, in his sort of pigeon Spanish, yelled after the guy, hey, hey, amigo, mi camera. And the guy stopped running, fished around in the loot he had just stolen, found the lens cap, and threw it back to my dad. So in the middle of a robbery, that pickpocket did a good thing. Why? Because he bears the image of God. We often hear the question, why do good people do bad things? I'm going to try to answer that in just a bit. But how about this question? Why do bad people still do good things? I saw a story recently about a drug dealer, bad guy, who provided Christmas dinners for needy children. Good thing. Did you know that Hitler's Nazi regime passed legislation, lots of legis legislation, protecting animal rights? That is, they were prohibiting cruelty to animals at the same time they were exterminating human beings. The Bible explains goodness, the goodness of human beings, by the image of God. But the Bible also explains what's gone wrong with the image of God. And that leads me to the second point today. People are no longer good. The image is distorted. One of the most heartbreaking conversations I've had in my 34 years here at Chapel Street took place at the South Street campus a number of years ago. 
after a, a service, uh, a woman in her late 70s, early 80s, walked to the front, asked me to pray with her. When I asked her what she wanted me to pray about, she told me that she had been sexually abused as a child by her own father. More heartbreaking than that, even, she told me that I was the first person she had shared this with in the 70 years since. Or consider the story of what's now called the Tulsa Massacre, when in 1921, an entire region of the city was burned to the ground, the Greenwood District, a primarily African-American area of the city. Businesses destroyed, homes destroyed, and somewhere around 200 black Americans lost their lives, were buried in mass graves, and not a single arrest was made. Now, we don't have to look very far to see evidence that something has gone terribly wrong with the image of God. Because if people are basically good, why do we do such terrible things, oops, to each other? Why? It's because the Bible says the image of God has been distorted, and the Bible explains it like this. Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things, desperately sick. Who can understand it? Psalm 14, 1 through 3 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says it like this in Romans, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Human beings are no longer good and that human beings no longer bear the image of God, no longer reflect the image of God in the way he intended. The image has been distorted. Now, the Bible calls this distortion sin. Now, I know it's a word that our culture doesn't like to use much anymore. We don't like to talk about sin, but we all know what it is. We all know it when we see it. Sin is that which hurts and destroys. Sin is injustice and violence, and greed. We know what sin looks like. We just don't much like to look at it in ourselves. Now, to say we have sinned means three things. It means we have chosen in our freedom to reject the loving limit and authority of God. In a sense, we've raised our fist to heaven and said, you can't tell me what to do. I'll make my own rules. Thank you. Secondly, it means we have chosen in our freedom to sin against God and against each other. Thirdly, it means we have distorted and devalued the image of God in ourselves and in each other. Now, the Bible teaches that sin has three dimensions. First, sin is individual. That means I have sinned and you have sinned. But secondly, it means also sin is corporate. Now, we get the individual thing. That's how we think as North Americans. But we struggle sometimes to understand the nature of corporate sin to say corporate, uh, sin is corporate, it means that we collectively have sinned. And thirdly, the Bible teaches that sin is also universal. That is, it teaches the entire creation is somehow broken, is not as God intended it to be. We are not as God created us to be. Society is not as God intended it to be. And the whole universe is no longer as God created it to be. We are no longer good the image of God is distorted, but here's the good news. We can be made new again. The image can be restored. And this is the third point today. This mosaic, this image of a mosaic, um, is called Christ Pantocrator, and it's in the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. I was lucky enough to uh, see this in person last summer as I visited Turkey. It's, it's huge. It's 13 feet wide, 9 feet tall. But notice it's, it's incomplete. It's actually in the process of being remade. Here's the story. The Hagia Sophia was originally built in the 6th century as a Byzantine cathedral. And the mosaic was created in the 12th century, the late 1100s. It was later captured and became a mosque. The mosaic was badly damaged and then completely plastered over in the 1400s. It was rediscovered in the 1930s, some 
four or 500 years later and is now being painstakingly restored piece by piece. So even though the image was there all along, but disfigured and covered up, it can now be restored. And in the same way, even though the image of God in us has been distorted by sin, we are still in God's image. And God wants to restore that image in us so it can be made visible again. And restoration begins with the gospel. You've heard me say this before, but the gospel promises us three things. Four things. The gospel promises first a new heart. A new heart through the forgiveness of sin, but more than that, a transformation that's actually more like a heart transplant. Back in Ezekiel in the Old Testament, we read, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh and they will be my people and I will be their God. That's what Jesus meant when he said, you must be born again. By faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can have new hearts. But the gospel almost pr also promises us, secondly, a new identity. We are adopted by faith as sons and daughters of God, which means we are no longer defined by our sin, no longer defined by our culture, by our successes, by our status, by our wealth, by our race, by our gender. We are now defined by the one who adopted us, who gives us new privileges and a new inheritance including the Holy Spirit who begins to restore the image of God by shaping us into the very image of Jesus himself. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 8. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. By faith, we have a new identity. Thirdly, the gospel promises us a new purpose, that is to live and serve in his kingdom, which means new attitudes, new actions, and new behaviors. Paul again in Colossians chapter 3, you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, what does that look like? What does that image look like? He tells us in Galatians 5. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, the work of the gospel in our lives is both instantaneous and a work in progress. It's instantaneous because at the moment you put your faith in Christ, you receive the gift of salvation. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit begins the work in progress. The old-fashioned word for this was sanctification, the process by which the Holy Spirit works in us to produce spiritual maturity and Christ-likeness. Through the gospel, we have new purpose. But this process of restoration the Bible says it's not ultimately completed until we receive the fourth promise of the gospel, and that is our new destiny. Listen to John in 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Now, John here is talking about the great hope of heaven, the resurrection into a new life and the new heaven and new earth that is waiting for us all who put our faith in Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. By faith in Christ, we have a glorious new destiny. Many years ago, I had a very close friend he grew up in a Christian home, as I did, grew up in a church, came to faith very early in his life. But as is so often the case, as he got into late adolescence, uh, he began to drift a bit, spiritually speaking. By the time he got to college, he'd pretty much left his relationship with Jesus behind and threw himself headlong into uh, the, the culture and life of a large secular campus and all that that entails. The turning point in his story, he says, came in the second year of his university studies when he woke up one morning 
in a dorm that was not his, badly hung over, next to a young woman whose name he did not even know. He said he got up, and as he stood in front of the bathroom mirror, he was stunned to realize he did not recognize the face looking back at him. He did not know who he was. He said that day he packed up all his stuff from his dorm room, put it in his car, and quit school and drove all the way home. He said on that trip home, he had a very long and personal and honest conversation with Jesus. And he says by the time he got home, he had been made new. New heart, new identity, new purpose, and new destiny. One of the things I love most about God's word is that it rings true to what we see all around us. It explains what we see all around us, and it explains what we see within us. It explains what I see in myself. And that is that we have been created in his image. Very good. But that image has been distorted in us. It's been distorted, marred, broken. But that image can be restored by his goodness and by his grace. Would you bow with me as we close? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for showing us the truth about who we are, the truth about how and why we were created, and about what's gone wrong in the world around us and in each one of us. Thank you for your transforming grace. Your grace that can alone remake us, reshape us into your image that we not only can live in the hope of our glorious destiny as your children, but that we can be agents of your own goodness in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.